we have Jeff from 90 Pound Wuss, uh, unbelievably legendary tooth and nail band. <laughs> one of those early tooth and nail bands that everybody fell in love with. And uh, it's been some time since you guys have really done much of anything. But we're really, really excited to chat about 90 Pound Wuss's history, some of your upcoming shows, and uh, some new stuff that's going to be coming down the pipeline. But uh, anyway, how are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing pretty good. It's uh, nice and sunny out here in Seattle, and uh, it's a great day. I, yeah, I'm doing good. So there is some sun in Seattle. That does exist. The, 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 soul, the, the star actually shines. It does from about, I mean, all summer, almost every summer, it's the most gorgeous place to be probably in the world. I mean, it's the Pacific Northwest is beautiful. And in the, during the summer, it doesn't rain very much. It does a few oh. days, but the rest of the year, it's pretty drizzly and it doesn't rain like it does in the South. That's where people get their yeah. head face wrong. It's always constantly like just moist and drizzly. Um, mm. It's not. And then sometimes it rains heavy, but the heavy rain here is like uh it's not even comparison to those afternoon like orlando florida rains that just dump for a second <laughs> yeah, and then all, all of it just evaporates it's weird so that's true and, and driving through um uh like louisiana i remember was <laughs> uh we had to pull over because we couldn't see anything it would rain it's never like that you can always right. drive here when it's raining yeah i i uh i love like that romanticized thing in like all those 90s rom-coms where it's always raining in seattle mm -hmm. and it, it just there's and they're always driving a jeep like a like a like a wagoneer it would be a subaru like now it'd be a subaru right. now yes. yeah totally but it, it there's like this like romanticized feeling you have about it and it's it's the 90s as well so yeah. it's like the center of the world for a little while i don't know there's just something cool about it it's still like you know it's pretty uh weird being here because there's such a disparity in like a uh, income for like i mean this is a big income. hub for tech workers yeah so there's microsoft there's google facebook like everybody has a hub here in seattle and you know it's just uh it's interesting to see how it's changed like it's changed so much it's not even <laughs> I don't even recognize it from, it's not the same place it was in the nineties mm -hmm. at all. It's just yeah. totally different. Everything it doesn't like feel a, like the epicenter of grunge anymore. It definitely, it's not grungy. You got to go like uh South or North or East or West. And then it's still like that in like Tacoma is, is yeah. more like uh, what Seattle was in the nineties. And a lot of musicians who are from here live in Tacoma now. Mm. Um, so you know, it, it still exists in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, Portland's a little bit weird, too, like in, in the fact that it's also like there's areas of Portland that are just you like can't even believe that this was Portland, like the place where it's supposed to be completely filled with homeless people. But it's like you cross the street and there's all these tents on the sidewalk. And then the other side's like total yuppie. It's it's so right, bizarre. Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk about the early days of 90 Pound Wuss. Uh, you guys started uh, way back in the day. Actually, uh, the year that I was born. I just got to say that. Are you, uh, you guys started in 1994, the year I was born. So it's been almost 30 years wow. since you guys started the band. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some of those early days. How did you guys get together and start playing some punk music and and playing shows and all of that? What, what was uh, kind of the impetus? What are the origins of of 90 pound was oh wow okay yeah this one's this one we've actually discussed a bit recently so it's fresh on my memory which is good um so me and marty uh the drummer went to high school together he moved up from california and instantly like he shows up in my art class his first day and he's wearing like purple dr martins and like a nice. maybe a cure t-shirt or something and so we hit it off like instantly we were all into punk and goth and industrial and stuff um this was before nirvana got popular we hit it off we were friends for a long time all through high school like he's one of my best friends in the world still today and uh um we were in this band with uh other friends of ours that was more like a gothic industrial band called systematic and um we did that in high school and then oh i gotta ask real quick 
what uh what was your goth style were you like a mall goth <laughs> Uh, no, or, no. Or it was, was it more? Was it? It was like, even before uh, there was Hot Topic in the mall. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, so it was more closer to like, uh, like Smiths kind of. Oh, I love this kind Smiths. of look. Um, no, it was it was more Robert Smith of the Cure. Okay, all I right. Think cool. Him cool. and maybe like some some Bauhaus kind of things. Like we were. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Are, are probably the bands we listened to the most were probably the Cure, Bauhaus, and that very first christian death album which is like uh has rick agnew who was in the adolescence and a bunch of other punk bands and stuff he plays guitar on it that first the very first christian death record is phenomenal and that wow. really influenced actually 90 pound was on all three of our records probably but um uh yeah so we were kind of like more like you know big spiky hair yeah um we did wear makeup sometimes, definitely like into that. Mm. For, you for know, I, I was going to say some of your guys' early band photos. I mean, you definitely look like a little bit of a toned down goth, I would say. Yeah, I think over time, like uh, as grunge got popular and then pop punk started getting popular, I, I, I definitely toned down more and had sort of a hybrid look going on, you know, much more like, a, yeah, I got really into like, um, you know, post punk, like Public Image Limited and like stuff like that 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 you know which is still pretty much at then it was kind of considered goth anyways whatever like Su old susie and the banshees and oh, yeah. whatever else so um we were we were always into and, and you know i was always into dead kennedy's subhumans like minor threat like all the the typical either american hardcore or some of the more like british stuff i really liked crass so um mm. um yeah, but early on, me and Marty like bonded basically over goth. And what what the thing was at the time in high school, it was pretty much Nine Inch Nails and Jane's Addiction before Nirvana. Like those were the sort of up and coming alternative bands. Mm -hmm. So it was that era. And Jane's Addiction's like this hybrid of metal, punk, and goth kind of all hybrid thing there. So everybody who was alternative loved Jane's Addiction. Like even though they they they, I don't know if they really like. They're so unique, they kind of stand the test of time, but they also don't because they're totally like in this place that existed and then was gone. Oh, um, yeah. But they were, sure. those two records, we were really into those. We were into the, you know, the Nine Inch Nails and then Downward Spiral came out and that was even like more intense. So um, Skinny Puppy, we liked all that kind of stuff. So um, we met based on that. And then later on, like as like, there's this resurgence sort of of the, the, uh, punk stuff of like, uh, you know, Rancid got real popular. We loved Rancid. Um, mm -hmm. We just started getting it. We loved music in general, all sorts of music, but anything that was sort of alternative. Fugazi, we were big fans of Fugazi. Uh, Marty really bands. liked Henry Rollins band. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. but we all like before we met, I was, de I definitely punk rock changed my life. And that was sort of what led me into liking The Cure and all that other stuff. So mm -hmm. it was always like, I always would be listening to, you know, I'd listen to Bauhaus and then Dead Kennedys or, you know, Minor Threat and then, you know, The Cure, whatever, like it kind of all blended at that time. So um, we eventually, like we were doing this band, like, uh, well, how did it happen? That band broke up sort of after high school and me and Marty, like we're still friends and we, we were Christians. Me and Marty were like the two like punk rock goth Christians in a small town. So uh <laughs> We were embraced more by the punk rockers and uh, alternative kids, generally more than the youth group kids. They thought mm -hmm. we were weirdos. But, you know, sometimes we'd go to youth groups or whatever. And then, um, you know, Tooth and Nail started putting out stuff. And they, you know, focused, bow. I remember hearing that for the first time. I remember hearing the Starflyer record and the the wish, the first release, Wish, wish for Eden. Like all that yeah. stuff. And it was mm -hmm. like, oh, this stuff's pretty cool. And there's Christians singing it. That's interesting. And so uh, there was this weird group of punk rockers that had a big brawl in the downtown we lived in. We lived in Port Angeles, and there was this riot that involved the cops. And oh, man. I love these kind of stories. I This doesn't happen anymore, right? I mean, there's no, like, tribalism like this when it comes to music anymore. But, like, there's it, they exist yeah. all over, like, music history. I, I'm, I'm excited to hear this. So... The, this was skateboarding and punk rock in a redneck town in Western Washington. The town's called Port Angeles. That's where we're from and grew up. Um, and we were skateboarders too, and into golf and punk and whatever. So, um, 
I wasn't there on the night of the, the, the riot, but a bunch of my friends at the city pier, cause it's on the water got, um, you know, hogtied thrown in the back of a police car and all this stuff. Anyways, it raised the, uh, Wait, like actually hogtied. Yep. Like some of them, like they, the cops <laughs> were pretty brutal on these and we were all freaking kids, dude. Like oh I think the, the biggest, the oldest person must've been like 22 maybe, but most of us were like, under 18 so Dude. i don't know but it was it was pretty threatening anyways i had just left before that before the cops even showed up like i had gone home that night but um what it did was it sparked and triggered this awareness of the church community that where there were these at risk violent youth in port angeles and so <laughs> the local salvation army hired this um, musician from la that's an old punk rocker and his name's Jonathan Simonson. He passed recently, but I'll get to that. That's part of the new story. Anyways, he passed away, but he, he, he moved up from LA to start this teen center at the local Salvation Army. And while well, me and Marty are punk rockers and Christians, so we were sort of the first people that he talked to and said, Hey, come hang out at this place called, um, I don't remember what it was called. He might've called it the narrow gate, but anyways, one church was associated with it. The and, narrow gate. That's yeah, great. and it was underneath of a Salvation Army. There was a stage. There was music equipment. There was pool tables. So we all just started hanging out at this place, and then eventually another church sort of co-opted it. The church that my parents uh, took me to when I was growing up called Independent Bible Church. Just generically, it was an evangelical Christian church. So, but underneath of the the building in this alley is this wall and this little door that like you had to duck under to get in. And um, that's where it ended up being. And that's where we met John Hamelberger, the guitar player, because he was good friend. He became good friends with Jonathan Simonson, who moved up us uh, moved up to Port Angeles to help at risk youth. And so basically, John Hamelberger was a part of that helping at risk youth. And him and this guy, Greg and John Simonson had this band called Godspeed that was sort of like a, a, a metal punk band kind of thing. And so we listen to their music or whatever. Eventually they break up. Uh, apparently Hemmelberger, uh, our first guitar player, was um, asked to specifically help me and Marty because they, they, the church or whatever, parents or somebody thought that we were at risk. He was a little older than us, but he was younger than this guy, Jonathan, who moved up from L.A. Anyways, he ends up starting a band with us. Like we're playing together and... Um, we're doing this. I, I was playing bass and singing, and we kind of had this three piece going on that was more like, a, I don't know, we were trying to, I guess, write things more Fugazi ish, but a little post punk and all this other stuff. And then our friend, Matt Gunner Nelson, who was on the first record, the bass player, uh, apparently, like he becomes a Christian. We start having Bible studies, and then it just turns into what became 90 Pound West, and I just start singing and not playing bass. There's a little more to it, but basically that's it. And we were rehearsing in that space called the narrow gate. Um, so we were making music there. I don't know if John Hemmelberger, I don't think he was getting uh, uh, money from the church or anything. I think it was just, he was, he, he ended up being friends with us more than like on mission to, you know, <laughs> save us or whatever. So we just end up forming this band. And when did you uh, find out that the church was trying to get him to do this? I didn't find out. Actually, we didn't find out until we got back together. This last iteration. Around, <laughs> oh my God. I actually said, Oh, you know what? There's this weird little tidbit that like, they were like viewed you as like at risk youth and wanted me to help you or something. <laughs> so, I'm like, so we formed a band. Great. But we were friends anyway. It, it was just whatever. So, um, <laughs> totally like the church wants to save its members. So uh, anyway, they, um, so we would have Bible studies because Matt's like this new Christian in, in this like church place. And then we'd write songs. And this is, you know, by then we, you know, we had like blender heads coming out. Don't know, like all that kind of stuff in Seattle. And I had made some connections with them through going to like Cornerstone in 93. Um, and I, I somehow discovered a group of people that were taking two Volkswagen buses from Seattle there and I showed up on their doorstep like this is before cell phones and there wasn't much for email communication if I remember correctly even then there was it was there but it wasn't like everyday usage and right. so um 
somehow I went to Cornerstone in 93 with all these people and then ended up meeting, you know, Damien Gerardo, Dave Bazan, Matt Johnson, like all those folks that are now like friends, peers, whatever, like we've done stuff and, you know, made music and hung out. So I ended up kind of fitting in with them. Um, and MXPX was in Bremerton, which is like, you know, one of the next door cities to Port Angeles. It's probably still like an hour away, but, but it's like, uh, close by on, on what's called the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. So they're still from the Olympic Peninsula. And um, we were putting on our own shows. And so we did an MXPX show. And I was in this other band with uh, that was still kind of goth called This Suffering at that time. That was basically me sequencing stuff. My friend James playing guitar. And Teresa, who's, you know, uh, been my partner for all my life. We met in high school. So, um she was in the band too, kind of playing some synth stuff, but it was mostly me and James. And then uh, we played the show and I'm pretty sure it was MXPX, Plank Eye, This Suffering and something else. 90 Pound Woods hadn't played with those guys yet. And that's how I met Mike Carrera and everybody else. And, you know, I think they just probably thought I was some weirdo. I'm like rolling off the speaker and act, you know, <laughs> as far as uh, Christian bands go, we were pretty into like, the tooth and nail stuff and the uh, scattered few and the lifesavers underground, like uh, things like that at the time. And then we were all into sort of all the, you know, regular uh, stuff that wasn't as, as, as nuanced into a market sort of category as Christian rock was. Um, so uh, we met them eventually 90 pound was is playing with them. But um, early on, like, that's basically how that first record was written, like a Bible study and then writing songs. And so there's a lot of, wow. so the lyrics on that record are basically written on the spot from what we were like reading or studying, not all the songs, but most of them. And so that's why there's a component that I, I later changed as we got signed and started touring. I'm realizing, hold on, I'm like really pigeonholing myself and my art and like everything I'm doing by like being so like, blatant and we're not even writing songs like it was a whole different thing once we actually were on a record label and stuff it wasn't just mm. friends hanging out on a you know but everything happened so fast that those were the songs we had we didn't even yeah. think about changing them or whatever and i probably wouldn't have at the time because i agreed with you know most of the stuff that was going on there and um so that record stands out lyrically and kind of sonically as it's different from where the direction that we started moving in right which you know makes sense given my background and given everything and people quitting the band and different people coming in and whatever else it uh to me there's a clear trajectory that there was always like 90 pound was always had sing-along catchy songs on all three records and we always even on the first record asd red there's a few others maybe telephone wire that had like a sort of uh post-punk influence experimental hardcore thread going through it so to me yeah. there's a cohesiveness but um it doesn't necessarily sound like that if you listen to all individually except for my vocals maybe although even those on all three records are different so um yeah but that's basic that's the early origin stories the 90 pound was actually comes one more detail when we were practicing marty was super scrawny all the time um, now we're middle aged, so not so much. But um, <laughs> he used to be super scrawny, and remember those uh, like old like advertisements for like in the back of old like comic books and magazines that said "Don't be a ninety pound weakling" or whatever. And so we translated that into ninety pound wuss, and we're mocking Marty, and that became the band name. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. When you so, went to when you went to Cornerstone, and you're meeting all these uh, these heavy hitters uh, of like the Christian music world uh great songwriters and everything how did you how did you get in with them was it uh did, like like were you like showing them like your tapes or uh or were you just like trying to hang no they were all friends with the people that i caravaned over there with in oh, that okay. band and they all went to like a calvary chapel and that's how they knew each other they went to the calvary chapel youth group in seattle it was called crew and um it was really popular because there were they'd have put on shows and concerts and stuff but no none of those people were anything to anybody at that time that was right like, right that was the cornerstone where like dig jesus played and like um a tooth and nail was just starting but still had all the southern california bands um mm -hmm. and so it wasn't uh 
I, I mean, maybe Blenderhead might have played. I don't remember, but um, Blenderhead for sure played by like '94, and I think we played in '95. But either way, it was still like early. Like MX hadn't shown up there. Um, it wasn't. It, it was still like Tooth and Nail was just coming on the scene, so it was like definitely probably if there was any anything, it was like focused, maybe unashamed. Um, you know, Starflyer Fifty Nine probably joy electric like it was it was it was really early yeah for sure um that's that's a crew to be to be a part of though so Uh, is that sort of the beginning of the story of how you guys eventually get signed to tooth and nail Uh, obviously there is the seattle connection there i'm guessing there's something there but yeah what's the story behind eventually getting signed to tooth and nail so we were good friends with mxpx because we were putting on shows and mike um has said this a bunch and and we say it too right that uh, like they were you know on the olympic peninsula hours away like an hour away from us doing shows themselves putting them on and we were doing the same thing out here so we would start we started playing shows together and so we were a little older than those guys and um they kind of like latched on to us like big bro- like we were their big brother but they, you know they've always been more experienced than us i mean they just always have and, and even from the get-go more popular and all that stuff but they really latched onto us and really took us under their wing although they might say that we took them under their wing it's more the, w- however it works we were peers and friends and um so that's probably the main way so brandon had moved tooth and nail to seattle by then and he had come to a show that we were playing at olympia at the capitol theater backstage with um there was this like crusty spaz hardcore band we loved um that we became really tight with called behead the prophet no lord shall live and they used to be called muckle teal fairies before that and it, they were one of the like yeah. northwest premier sort of out punk queer core bands and we loved them a lot they were just really great and crazy really influential on like the probably the second 90 pound wuss record for sure the way that they were so chaotic And um, they had like an electric violin player who was, you know, three times their age. He's like in his 60s and just like (laughs) playing really ripping fast. It's like the weirdest band I think I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. Check check him out. Behead the Prophet No Lord Shall Live. They're probably on, got some YouTube videos. They're so (laughs) noisy. But Joshua Plague is the, was the singer. And we became really good friends. um, And he ended up actually, he was the roadie for 90 Pound Walls on our last tour that we did. But, um. Yeah, they were just a great band. And so we were playing a show with them. First time we ever played with them. And um, I don't remember who else played that show, but Brandon Ebel shows up and he liked the fact that I was so like dynamic and um, kind of all over the place and crazy on stage. And so uh, that's basically, I think they were doing a uh, that comp, I'm your biggest fan. And so they asked us to be on that. And I think that's probably how they gauged who they were going to sign that would fit with MXPX. Mm. And we were kind of a no brainer. Um, Same, same part of the world, you know, like hour, an hour away on the Olympic peninsula, which is basically like redneck Haven. Um, (laughs) So, and we didn't, you know, we had a lot in common with MXPX doing our own shows, promoting ourselves. um, uh, So we, uh, we get we get on that comp they like the song um we were playing really basic simple stuff at the time because matt was just learning how to play bass and um i was sort of relearning what it meant from um you know to to yell and and scream and do punk rock and satire and things like that as i you know my goth bands were a little bit more serious or whatever so um we uh (laughs) It was pretty fun and it, it was just a good time is essentially and so there, there's a lot of like joking around on that record and a lot of like just us being goofy and um you know a, a lot of it i don't like there's some songs i probably will never play again from that record i have a f- sort of fondness for them but like like the subject matter of girl song is fine but i think that my execution and the lyrics are kind of really immature and i don't know if i'd want to necessarily i I know it's a fan favorite but um we're definitely not playing that this year so um, maybe in the future (laughs) 
But um, there, there's some stuff like that that just uh, a little embarrassing. Not necessarily the content as much as the way that I approach those things. And I think it shows from uh, what we ended up doing and becoming. Um, yeah, but I think that basically we got signed a tooth and nail because of MXPX probably. And then I was friends with, you know, Matt Johnson from – Blenderhead, Roadside, Don't Know, and all those guys and everybody I met him. So we were kind of already like in that scene and started sort of playing shows with those bands. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just a natural fit. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow. Well, t- let's, uh, you, you mentioned that you're not going to be playing uh, a few <laughs> songs uh, from that first album uh, with some of your upcoming shows. But one of those upcoming shows is Furnace Fest, and we yeah. are just so stoked to see you guys at Furnace Fest. I know it's been quite some time since you guys have played together. It's been uh, just over a couple decades now, so it's been yeah. a long time uh, since you guys have played. And, uh, yeah, we're just really, really stoked. Uh, if uh, if you're a listener and you still have not gotten tickets to Furnace Fest yet, you need to go do that because you need to go see 90 Pound Wuss. But, yeah, well, uh, let's hear the, kind of the story around how you guys got roped into playing Furnace Fest since it's been so long since you guys played oh the only reason i'm even playing music pretty much and and doing stuff again is because of furnace fest so um well it actually goes back to jonathan ford who was in uh roadside monument and his current band is called unwed sailor and Mm -hmm. both of them Mm -hmm. played furnace fest last year now me and jonathan and doug and matt from roadside all used to live together in seattle um it was like our house would be basically roadside monument and 90 pound was well me from 90 pound was sometimes john spaulding who was our second guitar player would live there too but i either way like we all hung out and um so we were really tight we eventually actually formed a band together called raft of dead monkeys but jonathan was love that band name thanks by the way. <laughs> it yeah. was fun so that was post roadside monument and post 90 pound was was raft of dead monkeys anyway um I went to see Unwed Sailor in like October 22. Um, and he was really getting on me. I hadn't seen him for, I saw him at the roadside. Uh, they played one show before they played Furnace Fest in 22. And it was here in Seattle. So I saw him then. I hadn't seen him in years. He said he was coming back through with Unwed. So I went and saw that show. We were hanging out and he's just getting on me about like, why aren't you making stuff? You're very creative. You sh- it, it seems like it's who you are and you should be doing it. He was really positive and inspiring. And then he said, I was like, well, you know, blah, 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 giving my whatever excuses. Like I have, you know, three kids. One of them's an adult now, and I actually became a grandfather last year. So um Hey, congrats. Yeah, Look at you. Yeah, thanks. So um we uh we are all uh different life stages. Anyway, the uh um point was is like I really didn't have much of an excuse. I'm not really doing that much and and like I, I I'm in a, a better place like mentally spiritually like uh financially all those things that i really didn't have much of an excuse and then he said well what about 90 pound wuss and i'm like who's gonna place john spaulding's parts like how in the heck are, would we do shorthand operation and blah 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 and like we tossed around some names and um then he he just said well you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna text my friends at furnace fest and see if they'll be interested in having you play and then this goes back to our friend Jonathan Simonson, who had moved up here from L.A. to start the youth thing. He passed away. I went to his funeral, and John Hemmelberger was there, the original guitar player of 90 Pound Wuss, and Marty was there, ran into him. This was just weeks after I talked to Jonathan, and I said, hey, Jonathan said this thing, and I don't know if they'll call me or whatever or if it'll be a, a thing, but would you guys even be interested in considering playing? And then I get a text from a guy that I went to you know, was a part of Mars Hill church with named Alex early. Who's a pastor up here said that his friend, Johnny Grimes was looking for my number. And I was like, Oh, well go ahead and give it to him. Lo and behold, Johnny Grimes calls me and says, Hey Jeff, you know, I just was, I really like nine pound wuss. (laughs) Like he was talking to me all about it. It's a great Johnny Grimes. It's it's my best Southern accent sort of (laughs) It, it falls short, but there you go. So I was, I was like, wow, okay, he really wants us to play. And I I just said, well, let me talk to the guys and see what happens. So they had already said yes, at least. So there's three of us. There was always been four people in this band. 
and we we were like the rotating cast of Spinal Tap bass players, basically. Instead of drummers, <laughs> it was, we couldn't keep a bass player ever, and so um, we and uh, it made sense that they live in Port Angeles. Um, I was over here, and so I said, "Well, why don't we see about uh, Marty's brother-in-law, Matt Bailey, who actually played bass in Ninety Pound Wuss for about eight months." He was also in the outer circle with Mark Solomon, which was a tooth and nail band. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, so he played bass in that too. And so it kind of made sense. Like, well, if I just have to drive over there, that makes sense. So he said yes. And he was already knew some of the songs or, or had played some of the songs. I guess none of us knew any of the songs anymore. <laughs> um, and John Hemmelberger played on the first record and then half of the second record where meager die. Um, and then he had to quit. And we had studio time and didn't have the record finished. So we got, that's when John Spaulding came into the band. He wrote the other half so that he, he was in the band basically for just as many releases as John Spaulding. And I figured, well, we could try it, even though they're totally two different kind of guitar players. Let's see what happens. Um, we ended up deciding to have a, a second guitar player. So we now have two guitar players. Um, Colin Day, who's a friend of mine from Seattle, is playing second guitar with us and that allows us to actually um rearrange some of the earlier tunes that we Mm. that that so there will be a different approach to like uh we'll be playing legalism something must break misplaced society like a few of the songs from the first record that have a second guitar part that adds a melodic component and some other things that i feel makes them stronger where i'm at now um we'll be playing shorthand operation uh, with even some of the overdubs that Spalding did on the record. And it sounds more like the record than we ever did live. So wow. my goal with this band was to be, we got to be better than our, or at least as good as our albums, try to pull that off um, and not be like we used to be, which was just frantic. And you never knew what you were going to get, if it was just going to fall apart or if it was going to be um, every once in a while, we'd play really tight together live. But most of the time it was just like, a bunch of energy more than um a good performance so we want to kind of uh change that this time around i think we're older we don't have as much energy there still will be energy don't get me wrong but um uh i'm probably not gonna hurt myself purposefully well not that i hurt myself purposefully but now i'm gonna purposely pay attention not to hurt myself probably um um, so yeah uh that's that's basically the story in a nutshell um, of Have how you... we got back together to make music was literally Jonathan Ford and Johnny Grimes. Beautiful. Uh, so I'm, I'm really stoked. We, I feel like these synapses in my brain are connecting in ways that I haven't had in decades. That's and cool. Just like all this stuff's happening. I have more energy. I'm, I feel like a part of me has been restored by uh, making music regularly again. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, having friends to do that with. It's pretty nice. You kind of alluded to this earlier. Is it kind of strange to kind of tap into that older version of you or that younger version of you, I should say? Uh, Some of it is because I've had a lot of um, really interesting uh, religious and church experiences that have led me to a place where um, my faith is pretty personal. I don't care if somebody calls me a Christian or not. It depends what day you ask me, whether I'd say I am or not. And a lot of that depends on who's asking me and what do they mean by it. So there's all these things that um, don't fit in. And it makes me feel like some of the lyrics from that first record are um, simplistic and naive. And so there's um, an element to that. And some on the second record, pretty much everything from shorthand operation I'm comfortable with most of the second record. And then some select things on the first record I'm not opposed to necessarily for the fans playing that, but we have a 30 minute set at Furnace Fest and we want to do have fun ourselves and represent what we want. And Mm -hmm. so we are playing songs from all three records, multiple songs from all three records. So not just like one, we are playing some songs for the fans and some songs for us. Um, So yes, there is some lyric changes that I've made like the second uh, verse of something must break. I don't really resonate with anymore. And there happens to be some, ways that I've been able to change that that are very timely for 
where we live in the world right now. Um, maybe we'll blog about it or something, but, um, uh, yeah, so there's some things like that, that, that definitely, at first I was opposed to the idea of changing lyrics because it was a point of time in my life that meant something, but then I was, it's, it's our songs. I can do whatever I want. So yeah. then at that point I was like, okay, I'm going to change a few things here and there. Pretty much that's the only one I've changed that we're playing. So, um, and it's not the first verse, it's just the second verse and then a little bit on the chorus, but, um, yeah, I don't want to get into it too far, too much. Cause yeah, um, it'll be a surprise. Views are a li- yeah. It'll be a surprise. So <laughs> it is kind of interesting to see artists, um, kind of deal with that question of like, Hey, I wrote this when I was, you know, 18 years old or, or whatever. Yeah. And I don't, I don't necessarily believe this stuff anymore. Um, and a lot of artists re- refuse to change it because you know, like, they're like, that was what I wrote at the time. That's what I believed at the time or, or whatever. And then other artists like yourself are like, yeah, I'm going to change it because my life has changed. My viewpoints have changed. It's interesting to see that, you know, and I think that, I think that there should be some more artistic license to change your own music. I mean, that, that only makes sense. Right. Yeah. To a point, I also do agree with art is art and it kind of like stamps a time frame and does some other mm-hmm. things. The recording is that a hundred percent. So us moving forward, I feel comfortable changing those things that we want to, and it's not necessarily out of spite. Cause a lot of those, a lot of those ideas and beliefs and stuff. I mean, I was heavily involved in a church and was a pastor at a church, a mega church that it went sideways. Uh, and so I do have a fondness for um, the the ideas uh, that Christianity brings to the table. And um, I do have a kinship for if somebody's going to talk about God, in my head, the only God that I'm thinking of is, is Jesus Christ because I'm conditioned to believe that way and think that way. So somebody has mm-hmm. to sort of like, that's not what we're talking about, Jeff, and then have to take me sort of into a different paradigm. And I'm interested and curious. So I'm not like dogmatic in the way that I might have been during those um, uh, years where I was heavily indoctrinated into what I would call a church cult. Um, But yes, others wouldn't. But either way, like I I feel very liberated from it. And also after years of therapy, I feel okay to like talk about that and be totally open with it in like a book. Like I don't have any shame associated for with – any new ideas that I have or thinking or ways or perspectives. Like I don't, I don't have any shame for the old me. It just was what it was and I've dealt with it and um, it's sort of time to move on. Um, And, you know, people in 90 pound wuss, uh, there's some people that would call themselves Christians and some people that wouldn't. And some people like me who are definitely uh, like I said, it depends what day and Mm -hmm. who's, who you're, who's asking and what we're talking about. Cause I think that there's a lot of ways to define that thing, yeah. but, but my newest thing is it's definitely not a, I'm not a, um, uh, Trump supporting conservative Republican. I am not that I'm also not necessarily a Democrat, but right now I probably am. So that, that has changed a paradigm that I, I sort of know what I'm not. And I, I think some pretty heavy things around not being that, um and and that's just just the way it is and and where i'm at but we all get along like uh john hemmelberger he's like has done a home church for decades at his house and he's so he's a pastor of a home church um i guess he's probably the most obviously overt like sort of christian person in the band Mm. um but he's always taken approach to love and serve and respect and kindness and that that fits in really well we're all like uh yeah well i guess i was not meant to go so deep but there you go like so there's there's a lot happening with with that aspect and we've changed and so now some of our lyrics get to change as well mm-hmm. i like that well i appreciate the honesty i you know i know like 90 pound most has always sort of had this kind of interesting relationship with Christianity and more so like the, you know, Christian kind of in industry and all of that. Uh, and so I would imagine some of those questions that you were already starting to have 
20 plus years ago. And you're seeing that evolution of those questions um, throughout, you know, to the to now, which I think is really cool. So, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's really cool to see like 90 pound West being one of those bands that were like, mm, is this like what it needs to be like? And, and for you to like continue down that path of, of questioning, I think is really, really healthy for, for any human. Thanks man. Yeah. It's been a, it's been quite the journey, but what's great is just like being in this room with these guys, uh, revisiting these songs, like seeing if we were capable of doing it. We slowed things down a little bit. We were known to always play at breakneck speeds. Uh, basically, like, you know, uh, Marty was playing D beats, but like freaking like no effects style D beat, but like faster <laughs> than any punk, punk, punk band. Never blast beats, always like da 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 But so fast, sometimes it sounded like da 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 So um, <laughs> it's kind of funny, like, no, the, the things, and it's actually made the stuff sound tighter, like, uh, as a whole, like, I think the songs just are tight. Well, here's what is blowing my mind with seeing, like, the freaking lineup at Furnace Fest. Oh, my God. Like, some of my favorite new, like, punk and hardcore bands are playing, like, uh, Gel, Scal, Zulu, um, mm -hmm. the Calisteo Boys is math yeah. core, but, the, like, that, those bands, um, I actually got... I've seen Scal, I've seen Zulu. I'm going to see Gel in about three weeks, and I got tickets again to see Scal and Zulu up here because uh, they're touring as well. And then uh, I just saw Calisteo Boys recently with their Rolo Tomasi tour on the West Coast. Talked to them and was saying, "Yeah, like I'm in this band. We're playing Furnace Fest. I'm going to see you there too." Like, and then I saw Zeo. They came through recently, mm -hmm. and they're old friends. You know, we used to always hang out. It was so good to see them after decades, and just like. They're, they've gotten so good. It's cool to see my friends that are playing music still, like, and, and reconnecting with MXPX guys on this stuff is just, it's been so amazing. I'm so excited for this. Uh, I haven't talked to the Training for Utopia guys. They live here in Seattle, and I'm friends with them, but I haven't talked to them since they got back together, but I'm excited to see them too. They're playing a show mm -hmm. here that I'm going to go see. So all of us are kind of like doing this thing, and there's all these new bands, though. That's the yeah. my coolest thing is like, it's not just that I get to see Jamie Josta yelling at people in hate breed and freaking gorilla biscuits and youth of today judge. What the heck? Like, this, <laughs> is, this is like, I can't think of a better lineup for furnace fest that 90 pound was could be a part of. It's like everything that we love. So I, I am so excited that we get to be a part of this thing. Like every time I think about it, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do all day. Like, I'm just going to be wandering around looking at bands. My, my hearing's gonna go or something. Mm -hmm. like, what's one of the new crazy. bands? What's one of the new bands you haven't seen that you're really excited to hopefully get the chance to see? Hopefully you don't play at the same time, but yeah, hopefully not. I, I haven't seen uh, Gel yet. I'm going to before Furnace Fest because I just got tickets, so I'm really excited to see them. What is another one? Um, geez, I've been so so like. You know what? I actually kind of like that. Um, I haven't seen them ever, but I kind of like that band Holy Wars. They're really interesting to me. Yeah, they're more yeah. like they're more like kind of like a punk rock version of Garbage or something. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I was like, this is really cool and interesting. I just recently listened to the oh Vein FM. Mm, I, I, sure. I got introduced to them because they were on the Furnace Fest lineup, and I decided to listen to them. That stuff's great. I mean, they're yeah. not. It sounds like they got a few releases out, but um, to me, they're new, and so I'm excited about that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Chad and Johnny have uh, are just masters at assembling a lineup of like older bands that, and even obviously a ton of bands that haven't played for a long time, and and then mixing that with like really new, up and coming, really incredible bands, uh, and just that mix of like some of those older bands, those legacy bands, and some of the newer stuff. Like they they just are so good at finding that right mix. Uh, it, it's been pretty impressive over the last three years of Furnace Fest seeing that that uh, kind of mix of older and newer bands yeah it's totally cool like all this uh and it blends like all the genres like pretty much you know there's like right. all, all, all the sort of stuff under the punk umbrella maybe there's well there's not really any goth or industrial but other than that like it's all there like you got mm -hmm. punk emo hardcore like some indie rock stuff it's really cool man i i, I just yeah I, I me and uh uh my career we're talking about this the other day and we're just we're both really pumped on it it was it was pretty cool to like i mean talk about uh 
Hatebreed's always been a really interesting band, and I'm just stoked to see. I'm going to see Hatebreed and then MXPX like, yeah. right afterwards, and it's like they both kind of uh, the singers, uh, Mike and Jamie, kind of embody like this idea of of modern day sort of positive mental attitude, right? One hundred percent. Everything that they sing about, it's like kind of the opposite of me. Like most of the ninety pound wood stuff's pretty dark and like self deprecating and internal. Um, and, and man, if, if we do new stuff at some point, I would sure love to take a cue from those guys and be able to, I don't know if I could pull it off, but be able to sort of like do something that's so like, just like uplifting. Like what's crazy is hate breeds so dark, but they're so uplifting. Like everything yeah, mm -hmm. he says is just like, yes, I'm going to go out and do something tomorrow and make it count. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopelessly positive I'm yeah like, and mxpx is the same way right like you're like oh yeah let's let's freaking suck life to the the marrow out of the bone of life like let's, <laughs> let's just have fun and enjoy this thing it's yeah. so good Love absolutely well we're looking forward to it we're looking forward to seeing you guys at furnace fest uh, it's just going to be a hell of a time and so yeah we're really looking forward to it uh cullen should we move to top five let's go to top five most influential albums Okay, so th this is for me personally or for yes, the band? For, for, okay. for you personally. Now, when we say most influential, it's not the most like favorite or, or anything necessarily. It's it's the albums that have changed you, right? That, yeah. that, that, that kind of created a catalyst for change within your music playing or your personal life or your yeah. singing, however you want, to, you want to put it. So I was fortunate enough to be introduced to punk rock through – the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bullocks. Yeah. Um, as a teenager, somebody gave me a, a cassette tape that had Slayer South of Heaven on one side and the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bullocks. And granted, Slayer's great, but something about that Sex Pistols record, when it comes in with the marching and everything else, like blew my mind and changed my life. And I was like, from there, it was like discovering Seven Seconds, Minor Threat, Dead Kennedys, like uh, Angry Samoans, like all this punk like was the thing when i heard that so um uh that record definitely has to be one of them um this one's a little strange because it's a greatest hits record but the first time i ever heard the birthday party which was nick cave's punk band yeah um i heard the the album hits which was when it first came out it was a compilation of all of their stuff and that blew my mind the way that it was so like uh swampy and discordant and people are playing you know one guitar player is playing in six eight while the other person's playing in like four and like they're doing such crazy off the wall bonkers stuff that I, and he's a manimal like just like nick cave and the on those albums like you know he's he's making grunting crazy sounds sometimes with his voice that are just bonkers so definitely the birthday party as a whole but that album hits was the first one so that ch radically changed me you know i definitely think that shorthand operation or the last 90 pound list record my vocals were i i probably on some songs definitely wish that i could pull off that um, <laughs> you know so do other bands jesus lizard whatever like but that, yeah. that that was great so um another one the cure disintegration hands down changed me um that record's amazing. Um, oh, geez, this is off the cuff. Probably uh, Swans, their album Love of Life, an early one that blended, you know, very, very rock oriented, but in the industrial vein because of the way that they mm. sort of produced it and made it very driving and rhythmic. And it's kind of hard to listen to, super dark. And then I guess. Uh, Oh, shit. There's two that I'm thinking of. Can I do six? <laughs> um, you can have an honorable mention about. Okay. I'll, I'll, then I'll go with Dead Kennedy's Plastic Surgery Disasters. Mm. The, the strange surf guitar tones in that that are yeah. so like, filled with reverb and Drippy. Like, ah, 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 like, like vibrato thing going on <laughs> is, is definitely changed my life. Influenced sort of the way that I think about punk, the sarcasm in it. Um, the uh, 
honorable mention would have to be subhumans from the cradle to the grave because it's mm. a concept record that has like the only well no it's probably not the only but a 20 minute long pop punk or punk song like I think it's actually 10 minutes long, but it's still really but fucking long 20. for a punk song, especially yeah. for who's known for like two minute jams. So, yeah. um, subhumans from the cradle to the grave. That's probably my honorable mention. Those are great. Those are, that is uh that is kind of like a who's who of, of punk music right there. <laughs> that list. I, we, we can tell that the influences run deep within you. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> a huge threat in my life. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't realize like how like I obviously there's like some of those like goth and industrial influences in 90 pound wuss, but uh, I didn't realize like how much like you really were primarily listening to that stuff more so than obviously there's obviously some punk that you've been listening to for a long time. But uh, yeah, I didn't realize how much the gothic kind of influence was there. Yeah, I think when when we made the last 90 pound wuss record, which is probably got the best production, there's probably more of that tone in it i was definitely listening to a lot of nick cave stuff birthday party and nick cave and the bad seeds i was listening to lots of swans um crime in the city solution we 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 did like and were listening to like a lot of the like uh stuff coming out of san diego you know like drive like jehu and freaking locust and uh Mm -hmm. that kind of thing we loved gravity records uh when we got into really like emo kind of stuff right yeah. heroin and click attack atawi um, mohinder was a huge favorite of mine on where meager die of self-interest um but yeah anyway so there was always sort of like always this teeter-totter between uh punk hardcore punk and uh, uh you know i could go on about influential records but yeah yeah so so there's a I, I just remember those records definitely changed uh, the way that I thought about music the first time I heard them. Mm. I dig that. I dig that. Love it. Uh, Jeff, what do you want to plug? Obviously, you guys are going to be playing Furnace Fest, and I think there's some other shows that you guys will be playing as well. But, yeah, what do you want to plug? Okay, so I don't know when this is coming out, but if it <laughs> – July 29th, uh, we're playing our first show – ever in 23 years in Bremerton at this, you can look it up, but that, and then I have a band. We just released the record. It's called oh, nice. I love that album. Art. That is beautiful album art. Holy cow. Yeah. I just got these. I've just started sending them out for pre-orders. Um, it's actually going to release the same, basically the week that, um, uh, 90 pound was placed that show, but our streaming, platforms what we did was we took this 16 songs or 15 and we added another one anyways the uh, all this all the streaming platforms have singles with a b-side and that's how we decided to release it because we want to sell our records and that's how you should listen to it so we're kind of experimenting it's an experimental sort of like post-punk goth industrial noise band called dry bones d-r-y-b-n-z all capital letters um, it's just me and my friend Joe from Portland who sends me tracks. And it was essentially like, uh, as I was processing leaving church and stuff, it's kind of, um, it's mostly around that. And so mm. it was very cathartic for me to write and, um, work through. So that, that's definitely the thing I want to plug. Cause I know we'll also be making more music. Don't know if we'll ever play live. We've never been in the same room and made music together yet. So, <laughs> um, we, we might someday we'd like to, but it's pretty much that. And then, um, you know, 90 pound was, we were talking about re-recording some of the changes we've made to some of the earlier songs and maybe releasing something. So uh, if we do, it's probably just a seven inch or a streaming okay. thing or something, but it's possible. And then writing new music is very up in the air. So, sure. um, it's not ruled off the table. We want to play Furnace Fest, get through that, and then sort of see what we want to do. So you're saying we can keep our fingers crossed, hoping for a new 90 pound woods. You could, yes. All right. But definitely the music I make will happen. And Dry Bones is D R Y B N Z. I think it's dot com even. 
has a record on it and stuff. Yeah. Sweet. I'm excited to check out Dry Bones. I I have not not heard you guys yet. Uh, just look it up on the streaming services. Yeah. There's there's they're all kind of different, but it definitely plays into the stuff we've been talking about on the podcast of my Beautiful. like love for like goth and industrial and experimental music. It's, it's killer. It's more like that than a little bit of ninety pound wood stuff you could you could hear. But yeah. Beautiful. Cool. Awesome. Was it uh, one last thing? Was it difficult to uh, to kind of like bring that back out? And you, I, I know you talked about how like. You know, your, your friends were saying like, hey, you need to continue to make music. You're a great artistic person. Why aren't you continuing to make music? Was that was that like kind of a fun thing to do or did, was it like a challenging thing well, to kind of re- to bring back to the surface or? This happened a while ago, but it never got released and we had it all planned. And then like there's been a bunch of stuff going on between me and the other guy that um, we've been going through with family and with uh you know our 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 spiritual and mental health and even some physical stuff so starting 90 pound of wuss again was like i don't know why we've dropped the ball on this let's just get it out there and do this thing and then it's been inspiring to like oh yeah we're gonna make more music so um it's a pretty easy venture he makes great songs in my opinion and sends them to me and i mess with them and tweak him and throw down some vocals bass maybe some drum tracks and stuff and now that I'm like, I've been learning like how to actually use uh, a, a DAW better. And, you know, uh, so I, I use Ableton. And so I'm able to sort of like now contribute to making stuff in that way. Um, yeah, I guess the, the only other thing would be, um, yeah, I started this like a uh, aromatherapy candle company a while ago. Oh, wow, really? Okay. That, um it's called <laughs> it's kind of corny it's just my it's it's my alias it's called suffering light oh, so wow. um we basically like uh it's out of my house and <laughs> you can find us on the web but yeah i, I started that and I'm, I'm i'm selling aromatherapy like candles beautiful wow. so like like what's what's the uh what's the the, the driving force behind it? Are, are they like um are they you know, like perfect, like 100% sustainable. Do they last a long time or do they like, like, like what special sense do they have? Well, it's more like just for, um, you know, sort of health purposes. And we started making them ourselves and, and then we just thought that they were really, so they're good smells Yeah, and, and, and they, they fill up your room with a nice good smell. You know, we have like tangerine and like eucalyptus. Um, See, this is great berry. because Mason smells like a 90 pound wuss and he needs something to make his house smell better. Oh, that's uh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'm Mason, all about this. Mason needs to chill out too. So something to, uh, you know, chill out his mood would be 100% great. Mm-hmm. I, I would recommend the um, eucalyptus one. It's very calming. Oh, mm. there we go. There I'll, we go. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, what's the best scent for somebody who has daddy issues? Oh, well, that's really interesting because, you know, I mean, since it's supposed to be some sort of therapy, I'm guessing it's supposed to help, issues. you know, these scents have got to help different <laughs> issues. So what what's the best scent to help uh, help somebody? We, we with usually use issues? patchouli mixed with rosemary and a little of bamboo. <laughs> it's very earthy, but it brings you down to like calm you down to this level and energizes you at the same time. And nice. it conjures it conjures a therapist in your room with you. Yes, you can, definitely. You can... There's. <laughs> There's you a spiritual talk- therapist coming out of the candle. Wow. <laughs> it's like a genie in a bottle. It's actually peyote. <laughs> yes. Well, we don't tell the secret ingredient. Well, there we go. Sorry for uh, speaking the truth out loud. <laughs> Jesus, Colin. Colin. Well, Jeff, uh, we're so excited to see you at Furnace Fest here soon. Uh, we're just a couple months away, and we'll uh, we'll see you. We'll give you a big hug, and uh, it, it's going to be such a good time. So I'm glad that you're going to be hanging out uh, for the weekend, watching uh, watching some other bands. So I'm sure we'll run into each other at some point. But we're just super stoked. And also, congratulations on the aromatherapy candle business. Thank you. Suffering light. Suffering light. I love it. Yeah. <laughs>